Hello, everybody. Welcome back to YCR's Food for Thought series. For anyone that is just seeing YCR for the first time, we are an advocacy group made by students and young professionals for students and young professionals. We believe that Canada can have a strong future in resources, the economy, and the environment. My name is Hannah, and I'm a third-year natural science student at the University of Calgary. I just celebrated my two-year anniversary with YCR, which is super exciting. Today, we are shaking up our Food for Thought format a little bit. As we are busy preparing for a stacked summer program, we would like to recap on some of our favorite Food for Thought moments from the last year. I have chosen clips from two of my personal favorites, the first of which is from Jonathan Piquet's Guide on How to Help Our Planet Evolve. I've chosen this moment as Jonathan discusses some of the solutions and innovations required to solve energy and climate issues that we face today. He emphasizes the personal responsibility that we all bear and how all of us can positively influence ethical change. The second and third clips are from Mike Renschak, CEO of Bruce Power. Mike discussed nuclear's roles in achieving a low carbon future and in other imperative industries such as the medical field. Together, these moments highlight the importance of the nuclear industry in the lives of all Canadians. Thank you so much for joining us today. What's the solution to that problem? Well, we got to reduce our demand. That's number one. Do your part, buy local. Convince people to do the same, be mindful about what you're doing. And then number three is innovation, which brings us to where I currently work. So innovation, what, what do we mean? It's the race to cleaner burning fuels. So there are solutions. And the main solution for the three industries I just talked about, planes, transport, and entertainment, is going to be hydrogen. It's what we're talking about. Um, it's what all these conventions I go to, everybody's talking about hydrogen as being the next fuel because it is fuel. You can actually power a plane, a, a boat, um, a ship using hydrogen. Now, the main problem with hydrogen right now, it's very expensive and there are three, three types of hydrogen. The gray hydrogen is produced by burning fossil fuel. So not helping. Blue hydrogen produced by burning fossil fuel, but offsetting the carbon. So carbon offset, carbon sequestration, there's tons of companies that will let you offset your carbon if you so wanted to. Ten tree is an example I, I mentioned. When you buy a piece of clothing, they plant ten trees. But if you um, want to offset more carbon, you can buy a carbon offset membership and basically offset your carbon for your, your, your whole year. And they've even got gifts, you know, Mother's Day gift, uh, offer your, your mother a carbon offset. You know, those, so, so those are things that we need to understand that we can actually do to help um, with the issue. And then number three is green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is produced by renewable energy. So it's really the key to, key to doing it, but only 1% of the hydrogen currently being produced is green. And then the, the last piece is, which is probably the best kept secret about uh, our commercial nuclear facilities, that we do far more than just generate electricity. We make medical isotopes that, that save lives every day. Uh, in fact, at, at our, our plant at Bruce Power, uh, we make cobalt 60, which is used to sterilize about 40% of the once use medical devices around the world. So if you go to the doctor's or dentist's office, literally anywhere in the world, and they take something out of a plastic bag, an instrument out of a plastic bag, there's a 40% chance that it was sterilized by an isotope made in Tiverton, Ontario, town of 2000, right? So it's, and we also make cancer treatments. So we power a device that was invented here in Canada called the Gamma Knife, and it's used for brain tumor treatments. That's a non-invasive treatment for brain tumors. Uh, you know, quite frankly, I. I often say, like, how many people know somebody that's had cancer, right? And so my sister-in-law uh, called around Christmas time, and she had a brain tumor, and she said to me, do you know anything about the gamma knife? And I, I was able to explain to her uh, what it does and how it's used simply because we make the isotopes for it. Bruce Power is fully responsible for operating and investing in our units. And that includes all the costs of our operations and our maintenance, our multi-billion dollar life extension project, our used fuel management, and the eventual decommissioning of the site. We know that as citizens and businesses in this province, you're counting on us to provide safe, reliable, and carbon-free energy for decades to come. With our ongoing investments in this site, we are extending our operations through 2064. We are guaranteeing good paying jobs and billions in annual economic investment across the province. 
as well as clean air and reliable electricity for the people of Ontario. We continue to expand our production of medical isotopes that will support the future of cancer-fighting technologies in Canada and around the world. Nuclear power does more than keep the lights on. We save lives every day. We make Ontario cleaner and the world a healthier place for families to live and for businesses to grow. Thank you for coming today and welcome to Bruce Power. So thanks for playing that video. It shows you some pictures so you get to see the plant and the people. And our people are fantastic. Uh, they're absolutely amazing what they do every day, especially through the pandemic. Came into work every day, produced electricity and, and made uh, medical isotope harvests that really helped uh, combat uh, climate change. In fact, our isotope har harvest for COBOL in the, in the two years, we were able to sterilize something like 50 billion pairs of uh, surgical gloves or swabs. So we were a major, uh, a major healthcare provider all throughout the pandemic to keep uh, to keep materials flowing and and keep uh, keep people healthy and safe. Next slide, please. So so what does this mean? Like, uh, what does nuclear power mean in the context of electricity? First, from the aspect of cost. So in Ontario, uh, sixty percent of the electricity provided is nuclear energy. About twenty five percent of the supply mix is hydro. Uh, we have about eight percent solar and and uh, wind, and that's backed up by natural gas and some biomass. And when you look at Ontario, our average price for electricity is about 13 and a half cents. And here's how the different electric sources uh, contribute to that price. So uh, our price is about 7.85 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, with Ontario power generation about 9.6 cents. Uh, gas is about 12 and a half cents. And that, this is, these are last year's numbers. So natural gas prices have tripled uh, during that time frame. So it's much more expensive now. Uh, wind's about 15 cents. And solar is about 49 cents. With biofuel at about 30 cents or 27 cents and hydro is about, uh, about six cents. So think about that, 60% of the energy is, is roughly, uh, not, I'll say nine cents plus six cents uh, is about 85% of the energy. So the low cost produce, production is really around nuclear and hydro here in Ontario. It's holding the price of power down. And what we've been able to achieve is in, in uh, 20, 12, 13 timeframe, we were able to phase out all coal generation here in Ontario. And uh, that was accomplished by Bruce Power supplying 70% of the energy needed for the phase out of those coal plants through the restart of some of our nuclear facilities. What that meant was in uh, peak times, we had like 53 days where the ozone was so bad, if you had asthma, you couldn't come outside in Toronto every summer. Uh, since 2014, it's like zero, like you may get a fraction of an hour. Uh, it's really done a lot to clean the air here in Toronto. Hi, my name is Lily Peterson. I've been with YCR for about a year now. I took the journalism program at SAIT until 2019. These are my favorite clips from the past year, and I think they're really interesting because they're not only talking about rising out of poverty in Indigenous communities, but also talking about the progress that's been made. I hope that you find them as interesting as I did. Thanks. We we promote uh, we we promote uh, natural resource industry. We advocate for them. We we go against um, legislation that uh, creates problems and more regulatory hurdles for uh, national corporations. Uh, including mining, uh, tar sands or the oil sands, um, including coal mining, met coal mining. We just promoted uh, met coal mining because of chiefs who are supporting the met coal mining in Southern Alberta. So we, we've done that sort of thing. We, we started a conference company. Um, and basically it's, a, it's pretty much, NCC is pretty much a conference company. We, um, we had our first conference in, 2018, we had 26 chiefs come out 
we wrote a five five year business plan to um, access 100 pro development chiefs. Those are chiefs that support all industries, including oil sands and uh, Medco mining, those type of things. If the if a chief wants to join our group, um, they have to approve or support all the natural resource industries. They can't, you know, support forestry and be against oil sands. So it's tough. We have to turn away some chiefs, um, but we think we we got a lot more than 100 across Canada. We think there are as many as 400 pro development chiefs who want to get their people employed. They see the opportunities there, right? You got Fort Mackay First Nation, who's probably the richest community in uh, Canada, you know, with all the First Nation people that work in the oil sands industry there. And it took them decades to transition from, you know, social welfare society to workers in the oil sands of business. So I think uh, they're pretty proud of what they did and we're trying to access that type of opportunity as best we can. So, um, you know, the natural resource sectors lead the country in all sectors in, in, in relationships. And if I can be very honest with this conversation, which I will be, because that's who I am. Traditionally, we were shut out of everything, as I mentioned. Then we got a few jobs and then we got some businesses. Um, then we started uh, actively pursuing uh, joint ventures with these companies. And now we're a place where we're actually own, um, uh, we're actually co-owning uh, infrastructure together. They've had to do it. The government's responsibility is 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 the fiduciary responsibility is is on them, the federal government, for for our for our people. But they don't know how to do it, so they pass that responsibility down on the resource companies. And so through trial and error, uh, resource companies have been coming to the table and trying to build relationships because they know if they don't. Um, conflict ensues and conflict with uh, a growing, a going concern such as indigenous rights, UNDRIP, et cetera, um, is only going to fuel uncertainty for the shareholders. So um, companies there, but I'm not to say that's very skeptical view. Um, so some companies I think still operate in that kind of space, but I think a lot of companies are, have been past that already. Like, like a Dr. Eric Newell, who was with Syncrude many years ago, he had the vision back then like 25, 30 years ago, he said to, to his cohorts when they were challenging him, why you're giving contracts to those damn Indians, they should stay on reserve where they belong. This is 30 years ago. And Dr. Eric Newell said he was the CEO of Synchro. Those are our future workforce. Those are our future business partners. And this is this is our future. We need to start investing now. And so you've had the Syncrews, the Suncors, the Snovises, you know, Imperials coming along. Um, so those companies get it. They know that their bottom lines improve when they, um, they, and we've got some incredibly talented Indigenous entrepreneurs across this country in all sectors, and their bottom lines improve when they work actively with us versus against us. Hi, everyone. My name is Lexi, and I've been with YCR for under a year. I am currently a student at Bishop's University in Sherbrooke, Quebec, and I am studying business there. Here are two of my favorite clips from this past year's Food for Thought. The first one is about fishing and how fisheries can actually reduce a personal carbon footprint. And the second one is about uranium and the quality of uranium that is produced in Canada. Uh, there's an organization called the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy, and it has done a number of an different analyses. And they found that under optimistic projections regarding alternative marine aquaculture, feed innovations and uptake, the ocean can provide over six times more food than it does today. Just think about that, six times. Um, and that would represent more than two thirds of the animal protein needed to feed uh, the future population. The high level panel also found that increasing the fraction of ocean-based food in the global diet in place of animal-based proteins uh, this would reduce the carbon intensity, intensity of our global food system and help mitigate climate change. And looking at some numbers, uh, blue foods are less carbon intensive than other protein sources. So eating more fish can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with our individual diet. So as, as individual consumers, this is one area where we can make a significant difference um, without uh, a significant uh, disruption of our uh, standard of living or way of life. Addressing challenges in the world like climate change and biodiversity requires tremendous amount of investment. And another interesting finding from the high level panel 
is that the benefit ratio for investments in ocean-based proteins is 10 to 1. So, you know, we should all be supportive of investments in sustainable blue food, and I wish our own retirement savings yielded those uh, types of returns. Canada is unique in the fact that our uranium is produced, and it's actually the largest producer, as I said, second largest producer, but the highest quality grade. In fact, our uranium mining sites are located where there's 10 to 100 times higher quality than there is anywhere else in the world. So we have a very large deposit, but it's more importantly, it's very high quality uranium. You can see that most of that is actually in northern Saskatchewan, where Key Lake, MacArthur River, those types of projects are really well known for uranium mining. And those uranium mines are operated by Cameco. Now, you can also see that there are some uranium refineries, so Blind River, as well as Port Hope, were areas where uranium was refined and fuel is manufactured. And then in the yellow, you can see where some of our other plants are. Hi, my name is Miles. I studied political science at the University of Calgary. In the fall, I will be beginning my master's in international affairs at Carleton University. I have been with YCR for about a year now, um, and these are my favorite food for thought clips. They mostly talk about energy security, which is a subject that I'm really interested in, so I hope you enjoy them as well. Energy security, well, and we have a historian with us. Um, if I just want to add a bit of uh, historical background to that, um, it goes back all the way to First World War, when uh, at that time Churchill was uh, the Lord of Admiralty um, in uh, Britain. And he decided uh, that uh, if he changed, changes the fuel of uh, British Navy from uh, coal, which was supplied locally from Wales, to oil, which at that time was imported from Persia, the fleet will, the, the, the warship would uh, move faster and this would be an advantage for them in the war. However, this would at the same time create a vulnerability for the country because now they had to depend on the resources for that was coming from outside. So that's really, we could find the, the, one of the, really the first uh, major uh, historical point that energy and security became together, uh, unite uh, together. So that's, you know, it's, it's not the first crisis. And a crisis is, you know, where there's not enough reliable, affordable supply, basically. Um, and in Canada, we're actually very blessed. We have a tremendous energy resources. We have excellent hydro. I think we're the fourth largest producer of hydro. Um, uh, so the fourth largest export of hydro. We have tons of oil, uh, third largest reserves in the world, tons of natural gas. We have nuclear uh, we're starting to get geothermal, some pilot projects and geothermal coming along, and there are some places that have good solar and wind capacities too. Uh, and, but overall, our energy mix is very diverse, it's pretty reliable, and it's very cheap. So compared to other developing nations, Canada actually has quite cheap energy, even though if it doesn't feel like that this month. Uh, but we are blessed in that way, which is to say that there are many countries in Asia and Europe especially that are energy importing countries that aren't blessed with those domestic reserves and have to import energy. Uh, and so this is affecting them much more uh, than it is in Canada. In one way we benefit when oil and gas prices go up because we are exporters, even though you individually and consumers individually might be feeling the pain. Uh, you know, Alberta is generating more royalties, the government of Canada is getting more revenues, that kind of a thing. Uh, but there are many countries for which this is, you know, a very serious problem. So how did we get here in 2022 to have an energy crisis? And I don't know how much you guys have covered of all this. And I'm sure some of you follow energy Twitter and that kind of thing. So you might be familiar, but just kind of a, a you know, a historical macro historical kind of situation. There was a huge oil boom, uh, you know, from about 2007 to 2014. And I think the price of a barrel hit $140 at one point in 2008 dollars, which would be like hitting probably 170, 180 today. Um, so that was a, a huge boom. Part of the reason, and there's a commodities boom in general. So it wasn't just oil. Uh, it was all kinds of commodities. So agricultural products, lumber, minerals, all those things. And that was largely led by China, just emerging, um, growing very fast economically, and just being hungry for every kind of resource. And that led that boom. What happened 
why did it become a bust in 2014 was the US shell revolution. So that was a combination of fracking, um, basically able to access far more, whereas US was an importing uh, oil, oil importing country um, for decades. Uh, and that's where you know, it led to Middle Eastern wars and that kind of thing. Finally became actually a net exporter in 2018 and is today the world's largest producer of oil and gas. So in terms of energy and oil and gas, just a, a massive transformation, a massive earthquake in the energy um, kind of field. And so where the US became from a very hungry consumer importer to an exporter flooded the market, gas prices, you know, um, natural gas prices plummeted, uh, oil went down and that kind of thing. So what has happened since? So, so cheap US shale flooded the market, um, prices went down, uh, there wasn't, so there's no reason to have any more investment. So investors were losing money on oil and gas. They weren't getting their money back, um, stopped in investing into more production because there was too much on the market. Um, and then we also had climate policies start to play into that and ESG or the environment, social and governance investment policies play into that where many investors, large pension funds, those kinds of things didn't want to invest in oil and gas anyways. It wasn't making a lot of money. And then for ethical reasons, did not want to invest. And so that means that there's been very little capital expenditures, uh, investments going into the sector since 2014. And then you get COVID-19 and the pandemic and production and demand collapses even worse in 2020. So on top of a bad situation, you got even a worse situation, even less investment, even more disruption, even lower demand. Now, you guys know demand has rebounded. So probably this year we will hit new records for coal demand, for oil demand. Uh, LNG has hit record prices. There's not enough uh, supply to meet demand. Inventories keep going down. So now we're in crisis. Now we've gone, we went through a cycle where there was too much, we invested too much. And, and now we've gone to say, well, we didn't invest, now we have to catch up. The question now is, can we catch up? Um, because there's different factors in play with climate policies and investment policies that are gonna make it much harder to catch up. Even though prices of the barrel and, and LNG and natural gas are high, they're still not coming, you know, product still isn't coming online like it would have in the past. Hi, my name is Justin Sato. Uh, I'm a University of Alberta graduate uh, with a major in finance and a minor in economics. Um, my favorite clip comes from David Milia when he did a presentation for us on polarization and energy in Canada. I really enjoyed this clip because it takes a very common sense approach to our energy and how our energy works in Canada. Um, we should be using all forms of energy that we can. And instead of bickering among ourselves about which is best, we should not instead be working together as a country to make them all world leading, make them all environmentally conscious and make them all efficient as possible. Um, by limiting our sources of energy, we limit our potential as a country. And I think David outlines it very well in this clip. So take a listen. Canada is ranked sixth in the world for energy production. We control 20% of clean water for the world. We're not only in the top 10 on oil and gas type of approximations, but we rank right up there on hydroelectricity, on nuclear uh, for the United States. They can't live without us in what we do in Ontario. We also have positions on things like uranium to allow nuclear reactors to have feedstock to work and keep people with their electricity. All of these have challenges, granted, uh, with operations, but all of them right now give us more than what they take. And if we can continue to mitigate the things that are cons on each of these energy sources, rather than judge them as good or bad, while benefiting from what they give us, right? Then perhaps we'd have a better Canada. And when you look at Canada overall, we are already quite uh, divested. No, no, we're multi, multi uh, cross-sectional on all energy industries. We're not divested of one thing or another. We have everything from coal mines to wind farms, to thermal electricity, to uranium mines, to oil sands, to gas, you name it, Canada has it and ranks in the top 10 on most of it. But does Canada sit at the world table of influence as though they do? And how come when the world looks to us, and I can tell you firsthand, I've hosted the Minister of Energy for the United States here. I've hosted the head of commodities and oil uh, from Europe, from BMP Paribas, 
who uh, divested from Canadian oil sands underwriting here to speak to us. And all of them tell us the same thing. We have a brand problem and Canadians fight more with themselves, which doesn't look good on international platforms. You know who doesn't do that? Who's proud of both oil and gas and other energy systems they're putting in? Countries like Norway. And when they show up, they're pretty proud of what they do. We've lost all sense of pride in all our energy systems, uh, preferring to fight with each other either regionally or based on industry, where we could do so much with what we have. Other countries would kill to have this. I hope you all enjoyed our top food for thought highlights. Make sure to register for next week's HR panel on getting hired for the summer and how to better your odds at getting hired again next year. Thank you so much for joining and see you next week. Thank you.